What's happening, everybody? Welcome to The Gray Report. I'm your host, Spencer Gray. If you are a multifamily investor, an aspiring investor, you know, maybe you're already an investor, you're an industry insider, this is the place you need to be because on The Gray Report, every single week, we deliver to you all the latest research reports, data sets, news articles, and opinions, all surrounding the multifamily industry, real estate, and the economy. We deliver that to you every week in a newsletter, but we also break it down here on The Gray Capital YouTube channel. Um, a lot of interesting things going on in the economy, in the multifamily industry. We've got we've got all time highs in multiple markets, whether that's multifamily, stock market, cryptocurrencies. Um, we have inflation um, that's rearing its head. We also have the Delta variant that is declining in many ways. Um, a lot of different angles, we've got some great analysis. So let's do it. All right. Again, on the Gray Report, we're bringing in Matt Bosnagel. He's the director of communications here at Gray Capital. Um, Matt, you know, interesting headline: a Bitcoin and multifamily at all-time highs in the stock market. It's also at an all-time high. Everything's expensive. That's what we keep hearing. It's like, what's not expensive these days? We're seeing a lot of headline inflation news. It's really hitting um, kind of headlines. A lot of you know mainstream media out there. Um, now, but then cryptocurrencies, you know, as well. Um, and so a lot of things are at an all time high. People are asking themselves, are, is it, are we, is it too frothy? Um, or is this being driven by fundamentals, inflation? Where are we going? Multifamily is looking very attractive right now. We've got a couple of interesting pieces that highlight that. Um, but what is your sense of the landscape map with market said, basically showing us all time highs? Yeah, it does. It definitely looks, uh, a little, a little more heated um, than uh, than I thought it would be. Um, I, it's it's interesting, you know. People have maybe started to think about what if prices, instead of the context of the pandemic, um, they're maybe drawing their trend lines the past fifteen years. Maybe maybe inflation was always too low, and that's a uh, but but that's another discussion for another time. It just seems. Like uh, there's there's a lot of activity. There's a lot of reasons for growth, but then there's that specter of increased prices that um, that I, I'm not sure how unprecedented it's going to be, um, but it's not going away. And I don't think it's going away. And I think now you know, people are wrapping their heads around that, and they're expecting further price increases. And as we've discussed previously here on the Gray Report, it's that uh, it's that anticipation of price increases and the psychology of inflation that really can be the primary driver. Because then, when you know individuals and business owners start making all those micro decisions of anticipating prices continuing to increase and, and assuming that all right we're going to have to hike prices of our own because our we know our costs are going up and just like, like we were discussing earlier today just in like the multifamily industry you know so many buyers right now um are projecting significant amount of organic rent growth and higher inflation and instead of using a three percent organic rent growth um you know you know rate they're using four and five percent and when they go to execute those business plans those are going to be their targets that are setting and there are other businesses that are setting similar are targets of higher rates of growth and in a way it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy whether is that um you know is it the tail wagging the dog or you know the other way around so it's fascinating um times i think on the other side of the coin though we still have you know developing society aging society and technology that's going to be a counterbalance um but you know it'll it'll be fascinating to see kind of what wins out at the end of the day or we find ourselves in a again this goldilocks um situation where we're getting good solid growth which we kind of need we need some modern inflation but it just but if it doesn't get um kind of outside of you know the rails would be would be nice so yeah yeah it does seem like that's that's the question is um it, it, everyone's everyone's looking for a reason to be optimistic everyone is and we're, we'll talk about the stock market and um and other markets but uh but we need the economy to be there to match and to match investors and consumers um, spending. Otherwise, there is that you know disconnect and there's inflation that comes out. But. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, as we've mentioned um, on the headlines on the Gray Report, which again you can receive in your inbox every Thursday morning. Um, if you go to graycapitalllc.com/newsletter, um, it's it's continually reviewed and ranked as probably you know one of the best 
real estate newsletters um, on the internet. Uh, Bitcoin notches record high day after the US ETF debut. So there's a new um, Bitcoin futures ETF that launched this week, driving the price. Um, and if we you know look at this chart, you know going back, you know quite a few. Uh, well, this is only a chart from I think the last you know year or two, going back a little bit to late 2018. Let's go to more of a five year chart. Um, you know you. We had this huge run up, obviously, you know, last year and in 2021, it came down and people were anticipating maybe could get down to this, this 30,000 level, maybe even the 20,000 never happened really kind of a, just really a meaner version and shot right back up a lot of institutional activity. And, you know, is this a, a sign of just people needing to put money somewhere? Is this anticipation of inflation and people trying, seeing Bitcoin as a hedge um, against um, continued inflation? Um, and for those same reasons, I think that's why the multifamily market is we're seeing all time highs um, in terms of price, uh, you know, value appreciation, as well as rent growth. Um, yeah. You know, people trying to hedge from that uh, from inflation and probably and similarly. And I think this gives us maybe a little bit more information is on the, the public equity markets, um, you know, the S&P 500 and you know, Dow Jones, they were hitting all time highs. And what's interesting to me about the stock market, Matt, and this is where we're, want to you know bring you and ask you you know your your take is you know the stock market's a future indicator of you know looking yeah. you know a forward looking indicator and that it would be indicating that we've got a lot of growth and relatively relatively good times maybe uncertain but relatively positive news for the economy at least according to you know stock market for whatever that's and, worth and that's what i i think and i even just re reiterated what what you said but it is this case of, uh, of are they overshooting it or not? Because if they are just spending more and then there's nothing behind that, then that could that could keep things going and keep prices increasing without um, you know without any meaningful increase in productivity. Um, so are we, to say that they are forward looking um, assumes that everything's going to go great. Um, and I do think that the you know kind of the decline of of the Delta variant. Um, which we'll get to, is is really great news. But even this article, it's interesting. It, it, it cites an investor saying that there are favorable seasonal factors that should also help power the market. Um, what if these favorable seasonal factors clog the supply chain? There are things that may be favorable for the stock market, but not necessarily favorable for the economy. Um, but I do think, uh, like again, like you mentioned before, there's a whole lot of reasons to think that uh, multifamily is is a great place uh, to put your money. Yeah. So maybe starting there, Matt, um, the National Association of Realtors put out the report for September 2021. I wanted to see if there was, you know, we can start, I guess, on the multifamily um, section. Matt, what, what were, were there, did you have any, you know, really big kind of takeaways from this um, really? Yeah. So this is, report? you know, this is a few weeks old, I, it, but it does illustrate that multifamily is doing great alongside Bitcoin, um, alongside the stock market, multifamily has just been in a really great place. It's not necessarily a place, it, it's not like it does great while the economy does bad or the economy does great and multifamily kind of peters along. This has had an independent, independently successful, um, uh, especially when you compare it to other properties too. Um, it's, not, it's not real estate, it, it is actually multifamily specifically has just been doing great in the past uh, few years. Yeah. Now you can look at um, page nine of that report um, really shows the, um, the double digit rent growth for multifamily properties compared to um, now even industrial, which is like the darling of these of the past two years. This is the, the economy of things that were, uh, mm -hmm. the, you know, that were, that's driving everything. It's increased 6.9 to multifamilies 10.7. Um, it's that's not negligible at all. Um, but uh, it just kind of reiterates that there is a there is a real rush from investors and um, to recognize this. And I think that uh, it's an opportunity that it's it seems very almost once in a lifetime kind of opportunity in the multifamily market i i i believe it is i mean i personally i think we're going to see some elevated growth rates inflation rates over the next you know couple couple of years or so but i don't think we're going to see crazy inflation and i could easily be wrong i mean no one really knows but the reason why multifamily is so great is we can capture inflation we're hedging against inflation 
um, you know, on, at the rate of we have leases available to sign, which is if you're invested in a large portfolio, you're you're signing um, new leases, or you're setting your market rents on a, on a daily basis, so you can track day by day where the rate of inflation is, and you just your only lag is, um, you know, the rate of your your lease expirations. Whereas on these other asset classes, office, industrial, and retail. Um, you know, you could be signing three, five, seven, ten year leases, but you have to wait for those to expire before to really get any substantial increase. Usually there's, you know, predetermined increases in those leases, but they're typically relatively small. Um, and so multifamily has that unique characteristic and it's sh it's showing up right here. I mean, it's the only reason why. I mean, I mean, industrial is still up basically seven percent. That's really strong. There's a lot of new industrial and but to me, that this that is a good yeah. point. I wonder how much of that industrial progress is being held back by the fact that their lease structure is over longer time. It's it's they it's got to be. The, yeah, yeah. And now, now the cap rate compression in the industrial sector has been unbelievable because I mean, previously, industrial cap rates were higher than multifamily cap rates, um, but now there's industrial cap rates that are just bottoming out in the threes to fours. I've seen, heard, wow. read reports that in like Inland Empire in California outside of LA, I mean, you know, Amazon fulfillment centers going for in like the two, two caps. It, absolute, absolutely insane cap rates. So a lot of value appreciation. Um, and if you were in two commercial real estate asset classes, industrial and multifamily is where you would want to, where would you want to be? Um, you know, in, uh, there's some sub asset classes like mobile home parks and self storage that are doing really well also, but, um, yeah. And, and I think those are kind of subsets of kind of industrial and, um, multifamily themselves. Yeah. So a lot, yeah. a lot of, a lot of strength, um, to a lot of strength to say. The well, least. and, and this, and I just read this line, it said that weaker construction activity could hold the vacancy rate to below 5% and rents to continue to rise to 10% in 2022, um, which yeah. is another, you know, it's not, it's, it may not be a huge spike as we had this year, but I still, there, there's at least a whole nother year um, of, of rising rents, which you know, well, we'll get to. And, and, you know, the devil's in the detail sometimes because it, it's the, so often we're looking at market rent growth and not necessarily effective or like in place rent growth. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, there's a big difference between, you know, your, your market rent increases, but that could only be on, you know, a small handful of leases and it takes a year or more to move up to those market rents and then renewals. You're still not typically increasing at the same rate as your brand new leases. And so, you know, what we're talking about, you know, rent growth, we're, we're typically talking about, you know, that, you know, that, top you know top line you so know, a new on the a street new, a new renter would come off and pay that market rent yeah so but let's existing say existing renters then they're still paying with whatever their lease was and so like let's say you're charging a thousand you know average rent's a thousand dollars now your new market rent is um you know twelve hundred dollars so you know you you've increased you've increased um by you know twenty percent you're in twenty percent you know rent increase but you know a hundred unit property 99 of those units are still paying $1,000 per month. You've increased yeah. the rent, your new market rents. You've signed one lease at the 1200. The headline is your mar your rent growth is 20%. Um, but the reality is you haven't grown revenue at the property by 20%. It's going to take a while to filter through. And so what, what we're seeing is, you know, okay, maybe 10 more percent on top uh, for next year as well. That means, you know, that's, 20% and then it's going to take time to get all the leases up to that 20%. And then there's going to be an additional 10% on top of that. And so it's like, this is happening in slow motion, but we can kind of see where we're going. And that's, what's driving so much of the high prices in multifamily right now. And so much cap rate compression because you're seeing these huge lease trade outs of a hundred, $200 per month. And where you don't really have to do anything, you don't have to force appreciation. You don't have to fix up a unit to get an additional $200. You literally are just trading out the leases because that's where the new market rent is. And the additional value added you do is just kind of on top. If you continue to push over that, that's where a lot of people groups in there. New people, you just have to you have to cycle it out. You don't. There's no 
we're going to buy it. And now we're the ones raising rents, the previous owners. And this is just what we're seeing in acquisitions that we've pursued and are pursuing the current owner. They say, okay, we, we've, we've raised rents by 20 or 20%. We're, we were getting these leases. We've gotten, we've gotten them on, you know, 25% of the, the property. Part of our business plan is just to, you know, carry that out. You know, they can sell it, you know, a little bit on pro forma, get a little bit of higher price because we know we can get those rents. They've proven out the, they've proven really the thesis that those rents are achievable. And, you know, there's no reason to go in and, and do a, you know, major value app is also, you can't get the materials to even, you know, do the renovation itself. So yeah. it's, you know, again, it's what's the risk reward with the risk premium, um, doing some of these, you know, maybe, you know, lighter value adds, I think make a lot more sense, you know, these days. Um, but Matt, let's, let's get into the Yardi, just staying on multifamily. Mm -hmm. um, Yardi National Multifamily Report, September uh, 2021. Again, so we talked about absorption in the NAR piece, that was their big headline. Um, and then for Yardi, it's asking rent, um, which is what we were just talking about. Asking rent breaks records, yeah. uh, again. It is, um, yeah, it, 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 I just wanted to kind of note this. We've, we've gone over this before, um, yeah. but, the, but having these multiple reports all kind of in a line really shows there's no, there's no take that doesn't see uh, an incredible opportunity in the multifamily industry. Um, there's no take that says that, that rents are, are declining for sure. And they're all showing this sharp increase. Whether the, <laughs> whether the increase is sharp, it's sharper in some if you skew the, if you skew the charts the right way. But um, there's, there's relative um, uniformity in the opinion and in the results here. Um, in the in, in that how how they're tracking um the rents and uh it's yeah it's pretty dramatic it is now they are saying that the growth is decelerating but that is something again we've mentioned this in the past that you would assume and and hope um that there'd be some deceleration just because we've already seen so much growth like the consumer yeah. the wage wages are not rising by 20 or 30%. They may be rising by, you know, 10, 15%, but we, we can only grow so much, you know, relative to everything else. Um, and so you, you know, and the lag effect is row be nuts. Yeah. Yeah. The lag effect is interesting too, because if you're not getting that, it could decelerate, but your earnings could be accelerating because you're realizing those rents that were, um, you know, that had increased in the past. Yeah. But it's just a little stabilizing effect, I think. Okay, so Matt, real page. Um, renters occupy thousands more apartments today than before COVID nineteen. Um, you know, some people are saying, "Is anyone anyone going to want to live in an apartment with other people because of COVID?" I, I you know, some, some couple people asked me that, um, and I was like, "I don't know." You know, that's a, that's a good point, but the fact is, people don't have a choice. Um, yeah. Everyone and in, in someone said this to me yesterday. It's like everyone can want to live in a you know yard or the you have a house with white picket fence and all that but it's just unfortunately not um it's not what everybody wants nor it's what everyone um can have there's only so many of those there's not enough single family homes um and people yeah. certainly don't have the money for and that again, down payment this was a short report but it is an interesting data point and it, i i i would agree it points to um the success of the apartment and, and really um <laughs> we never really had the, uh, any doubt about the apartment market especially as it uh, as it relates to single family homes. Um, I think that there, that any rise in housing demand, that's the thing to talk about, not necessarily like the flavor of housing. Um, but I think that as, you know, that people's lifestyles are always, there's always going to be someone that in which a home, that, that lifestyle appeals to them. Um, but increasingly it, people are deciding, or either they're deciding or because of the market so tight, they're, they're living in apartments. Um, and so there's no reason to think that, that uh, the apartment lifestyle is, is kind of going the, by the wayside um, anytime soon. And I think, yeah, and I think a lot of people are intimidated to buy a house when they know it's the kind of the top of the market, regardless of if it is actually the top or not, but it's that, that's the perception. And they're kind of saying like, I just want to wait and see, hold on to my cash. And, and honestly, from just dollars and cents point of view, that's probably the better financial decision you know, invest in ass in an investments that make sense from an investment thesis, as opposed to saying, you know, I'm just going to buy my home and make that my biggest investment, which again, that's worked out for a lot of um, Americans over time, but it's not necessarily 
the most accretive um, investment, if someone's going to make the largest investment someone's going to make in their net worth, does that always correlate to the location of their primary residence? Sometimes it could work out, sometimes not. Yeah. So um, fascinating stuff. Um, again, really things are at an all time high. I'm um, just, uh, you know, just one other thing, you know, one other report. Um, and again, if you're saying, wow, these are great reports, I need to be reading these. If you're signed up to the Gray Report newsletter, graycapitalllc.com slash newsletter, we will deliver all of these reports for free. It's a, it's a, it's a free, we don't charge, we don't charge any, nothing. Um, every Thursday morning at 8.30. So highly recommend it. Matt does a great job putting these together. National Multifamily Report from Burcadia. Matt, tell just give us some of the, the yeah. like, some of these top takeaways. Again, um, this it, it's just another uh, a, another support for the picture of the multifamily market, um, and you can look at on page um, on page four of this. It talks it gives a longer term projection of where they think rents are going to go. Um, they see occupancy maybe slightly declining, but the rents continue to increase and continue to follow the same trend that they followed since 2011. There's no um, there's no enormous change yeah. in the quarterly rent increases. Um, there's some um, there's some quarterly changes, but year over year the trend line seems pretty stable. Um, so I think it's interesting that they don't see a snapback um, by any means, or even like a, a flattening off, um, and and that rents will will continue to show some real strength. It looks like they're sh- they are they're indicating a more normalization for occupancy. Kind of you know they're forecasting out the 2025. So base, you know we'll probably land back at kind of a 95 percent average occupancy, which I think makes which makes sense. Um, but you can see a, a big uh, delineation. Um, basically from, you know, March of 2021, basically they're saying we are just on a different, I mean, it's a different slope. I mean, this, you know, look at this, this is the growth rate in the slope over the past, you know, decade, and we're just at a different angle. Um, yeah. you know, we were relatively flat, you know, there was, you know, good growth between, you know, for, you know, after the great financial crisis. Um, and then we had, we flattened out during the pandemic and no one knew what to do. And then it's just been escalator. I mean, that's a, that's yeah. a, that's a much different angle. Um, and again, mm-hmm. that's that's where it's like so. We, in, and we've seen incredible amount of rent growth just this year, and then to continue to forecast, continues continuously strong rent growth, and and you know this is something that we we have yet to change in our underwriting is is the um, you know the input for organic you know rent growth. Um, you know, typically you know, is three percent. That's like a long term average. That's typically what we do. You know, we execute our business plan. We try to whatever we're going to do to add value to raise rents over the first typically three years. We that's what we kind of see. We've got three years to kind of move things, execute our business plan, and then it's kind of just stable after that. And usually after that, we have you know a three percent um, rent growth. That's you know usually anywhere from kind of fifteen to thirty dollars more um, per month per year based on the overall rent level um talking to different brokers so recently about that is and they've said a lot of the buyers we're seeing are using four and five percent organic rent growth which is huge when you think about how that's a compounding input so it's not just your it's little it's five percent every single year versus three percent that that's that's a significant difference and then again it comes back to that self-fulfilling prophecy that we we're talking yeah. about earlier mm-hmm. that we're anticipating this if we're, we say we're going to get it it's like now it's we're going to make it happen because when they set their budgets for those years they're setting that they're looking at their performance and okay this is where we're targeting that's where we're going to set the rent yeah. everyone else market does the same thing everything gets lifted up and again, it's, it's yeah. that self-fulfilling prophecy. And so I'd like, I, if, uh, I, I think that I've been, we've been hinting at this and I'd like to, um, I'd like to mention this, that September consumer price index report um, from regions. Um, I think it ties, ties things together. Um, I, I know we were gonna um, yeah. maybe cover something else, but I wanted to no, jump I, to that. Yeah, uh, let's, let's hop in there right now. I'm pulling it up and, and I wanna, bounce back to the Bercadia for just to finish things up. But I think yeah. this is a, this is a good piece. Um, 
And the reason why we liked it is because you know, you'll, if you notice, a lot of the sources, a lot of these reports are done by um, multifamily brokers or multi, or property management firms, which are kind of data comp, data firms also. Um, but they're they're you know like Bercadia, they're in the business of selling apartments, um, selling mortgages for apartments. So you have we have to kind of understand kind of where maybe they're biased. Now, obviously, no one's got to listen to them if they're giving false information and if they're just saying everything is you know rainbows. Um, but so the reason why this is interesting is this comes from Regions Bank. Um, agnostic they're not they're not they don't care about the multifamily industry and it's about cpi talking about you know how in transitory is this uh inflation and then, you know the headline you know this transitory inflation is making itself right at home it's not going anywhere <laughs> still yeah. this transient is it's it's hanging around which so is it really is it really transient and i i said this when i read this i, I sent this right over to matt um, is it, you know, it's obviously talking about all the inputs of CPI. Um, you know, we're talking about we're talking about energy inputs. You know, used car, um, food prices. Then this chart in the bottom. You know, and let me get a good zoom on it because you know, re- again, this is in the report. You know, re- read the whole thing. Um, and this just flew right in the face of just so many conversations I've had with some people recently um, that. I would say maybe aren't paying as close of uh, close attention and they're just i think there's an a, an initial natural feeling to say things are high so they have to come down and these things seem expensive but everything's relative and their conclusion looking at all things being relative agnostic no you know dog in the fight rent has plenty of catching up to do it's yeah. not leading the charge. It's fallen behind when we're looking at other elements of CPI, which that in context of the growth that we've already seen is is to me it's staggering because it's it, yeah it's like we're just getting started. This is this is already insane. Well, we and it kind of loops. Years? It kind of also loops back to what you were mis- what you were saying about how these are new lease rents and and there could be some structural difficulty just because you can't get everyone instantly in there mm, and, yeah. and it'll just have that lagging effect, but it will naturally maybe rise to this. But I think, I mean, just looking at the chart itself, it seems like there's room to grow even beyond that. Um, yeah. So I'm not sure if they're measuring by like market rents or, or the rents that people are actually paying. I don't know what the, what goes into that calculation, but that's it would be a, interesting to know. Yeah, that's a good question. If, if they're measuring um, yeah, effective rents or if they're, if they're tracking market rents, I don't think that they have like a citation for where that um, that piece of data is coming from. I, I assume I assume they're getting it from the Bureau of Labor Statistics that puts out the CPI um, reports. Um, so what we should do, Matt, is mm-hmm. see what CPI uses if they use effective rent, um, which is like what the Federal Reserve uses. I mean, they do have a metric of like kind of average, you know, you know, rental, you know, dwelling um, rent. Which isn't always the most accurate figure, um, but if it was effective rent, it would, that would that would it would be the more realistic of where we are and really illustrating of like we like that's just really showing like no, there's still a lot of room to go. And just as you see the headline, twenty percent market rent growth, that doesn't mean all rents have grown. And we're going to have this period that's going to be two to three years where rents are going to be growing steadily up to those new levels. Now, is, what's it going to grow beyond that? You know that that's you know we'll see and and that's where you know um commodities can track inflation um even even better than the multifamily the advantage of multifamily is you have the cash flow and there's a lot of other advantages uh that commercial real estate multifamily has over commodities um the commodities have some advantages um because you know like they really track inflation you know copper and oil um they're more much more liquid than you know physical piece of real property um but they don't to me they don't throw off cash flow um, and that, that's the biggest thing. I guess you can yeah, and, in a while well, and but. This, you know, I, I know our perspective and, and I, it's sometimes hard for me to get my perspective outside of the multifamily industry. Um, but it seems like this, this article from Regions was really written from the perspective of like, here's things you got to watch. Not, it wasn't that, hey, hey, multifamily, you've got this great opportunity. It was like, this is what, this is what economists, this is what investors should watch. 
uh, as it, like this is almost going to happen. Like mm-hmm. expect rent rent growth because this is what we're seeing. Um, and so here's this. Uh, so here's this space where things will kind of bounce back up. Yeah. And and I think uh, almost. And you know it could it could be an inflation driver. Um, I think that that was maybe a little bit impl- uh, implicit. There is that uh, there could be rent growth that makes inflation increase too. So that's yeah. that's another thing. Yeah, no, ex- exactly. It it is usually a lead a leading indicator. Um, Matt, I, I just want to pop back to the Bert this Bercati piece yeah. just because there's a couple pieces that, that I I think that we should mention because there's some good metrics just from 2021 year to date. Um, so just starting off average cap rate in the United States right now is four and a half percent. I mean, just, let's just start there. Um, you know, we were at 5% a year ago and it, you're seeing even lower cap rates in, in many markets, which is incredible. Um, average price per unit, 305,000 per unit. That's incredible. Um, now that's obviously, it's a national number, like the nicest property in Indianapolis isn't trading close to that, and that but that's the average. Um, and you know, and then the, the, I think the year built average product bill, I think this is interesting also is in that the two thousands. Um, so that was pretty interesting. And then top buyers, top sellers, Blackstone, top buyer, um, you know, Cortland, TIAA, um, you know, California State White Communities Development Authority, MG Properties, and then the sellers, Alliance Residential, Graystar, they're selling Blackstone, um, Equity Residential, um, good old Sam Zell, and then Crow Holdings, um, as well. Um, are selling. You noticed, you know, it's a uh, some similar names, buyers and sellers. I mean, we're we're the same way. We've sold a lot this year, but we're also buying quite a bit. So, good opportunities. Try to move, exit some deals, move into the next. Um, Matt, where do you want to go next? You want to uh, cover uh, Delta Delta variant, or um, you know, I, where, where do you where do you where do you feel? How are you feeling? So, if if we cover Delta, I just want to hit really quickly on this COVID uh, data tracker. And yeah. it has yeah. the infection yeah. rates. Um, and Got this it. is just part of the story that, you know, I'm, I'm trying to tell myself and I, and I want to be optimistic um, it, because if you look at that, if you look at the curve there, it looks like we're on our way down. Um, again, there's no real pattern. I can't, I can't call back on, you know, 20 years of history for this, for this virus. Um, but it looks like things at least, um, in the immediate future, will uh, will go down. I'm optimistic. Is it wrong for me? To, it, it what do you mean? There's no pattern. Little... You, you can't do technical analysis on <laughs> not, on, not on viruses. A year and a half. <laughs> well, no. Well, do it on the that's day. the day. Uh, that's the thing. I, Higher I think, highs, lower lows. Is it impossible? And and well, here's here's the uh, my my point is like I'd like to think we're making progress on it. I'd like to think that if there's another surge. Um, that it won't nearly, there won't be nearly as bad as as the one we just went through. Um, it's it seems more reasonable than not to think that we're going to make progress, that things will get better, especially as we learn more about what to do, um, you know, with the virus and vaccines and and even treatments. Um, you know, we just we're just getting better, and uh, yeah, I yeah. So, uh, but that being said, I you know I can't count myself out because I'm not I cannot read that. Uh, yeah, well, not sci- not sci- not scientists. Not scientists. Yeah, there's again no fundamentals. It's it's like we're you know trading crypto again. Um, but uh, you know higher high. You know I would say you know we got higher highs, and then you're having you know lower lows, and you know we're not. If if we had hit our other peak, I think that'd be really concerned. But we're on our way down, and yeah. Again, I I don't know. The biggest question, and this is what we were talking about, Matt, you and I earlier, is. Um, how much did how much did Delta really affect like economic activity? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, how many people decided not to travel, decided not to go out and go to a restaurant? To me, every same thing seemed packed. People were still doing what they're going to do. Um, maybe you yeah. wore a mask or what? I, but, you know, more of it is the you know you know vaccine. People not wanting to get vaccinated, and you know whether it's Southwest Airlines pilots, you know not wanting to fly, or you know just the issues of, you know again the supply chain, which we've talked about a lot. Those are the issues, rather than, like. But none of that those none of that was seem to be new problems from Delta. Um, maybe outside of in Vietnam, you know I guess stuff outside the United States. You know in Vietnam they shut down um, a lot of their manufacturing for a while because of Delta. Um, but other than that, I didn't like in the United States. We really didn't have, we didn't, there weren't any major shutdowns. I mean, some places asked people to wear masks, but like that's, 
it doesn't prevent someone from going into a store. Um, so, I mean, I think that that's the big question. If we do even have another surge, you know, what's the, what is that real effect on economic activity now? If it's assuming that it's not as, you know, it, it's, it's like, it's the same. That's- that's what's so interesting, and, and I mentioned an article that I didn't include it in in the in the newsletter because um, it, it just was a little confusing. Um, it said that consumer spending is up, uh, you know, people are spending, but their confidence in the economy is not necessarily there. Um, and I don't know if that is a direct inflation indicator or not, but if they're spending more and less confident about the economy, it just seems uh, it, it seems like a a bad mix. Um, people just don't know if they're spending, and and they, 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 don't, they don't know what to think, but you're, if yeah. you were really concerned, would you be spending more? Yeah, that's what I, I, that's, that's one of the reasons I think it's like, what are they expecting? Or is I, that the inflation? Are they saying more because of inflation? And it's like, I got, yeah. you know, if I don't spend it now, you know, you know, when am I ever going to spend it? Um, yeah. you know, or it's going to be worth less. I'm going to be able to buy less in the future with the same, you know, the same same dollars. I think, I don't know. I think a lot of people are taking things into perspective, thinking about their lives. What do they want to do? Maybe living a little bit more in the moment. And you hear about this talk about the great resignation um, and the forces that are driving that of, you know, okay, I want to do something that, you know, I'm interested in and I'm inspired to do. I, I want to do something, work in a job in a place where I feel appreciated, where I'm valued. Um, and, you know, while I'm at it, you know, yeah. You only you only live once, you know, YOLO. So why don't spend a little bit of money and, and keep going out? Um, I don't know. Is that, yeah. that maybe could be a factor to it? And people are just shrugging it off and be like, look, I just lived through 2020. You know, Australia was on on fire and we had, you know, global pandemic. And like I got through it, you know, only got one life to live. Well, and that's and that's what I'm hoping, you know, a lot of um, I don't think that it, that's necessarily uh antithetical to a recovering economy, um, but it may take some price differences. Maybe it's going to take more money to convince the, the uh, construction worker or the dock worker to come back to, to come back to her job or his job. Do you think that um, the Biden administration, um, so they're, they're one of their solutions is like, let's get the port of LA, I think it's port of LA, let's, let's just, let's just run it 24 seven. You know, they're only, it's only 12 hours a day. Let's get it 24 hours a day. But then it's like, where do you get the people to where so twice the people to work there where where the people come from the problem is the people it's like where are the people going to come from yeah i you know i don't think that that's a bad idea um i don't i don't either theoretically but i'm just talking more practically of like where do they like that's that's definitely not it's yeah it's not hitting the underlying um the underlying problem but i you know i don't know what else how do you double a workforce like that yeah other than raising the other than raising the wages, it's hard to see. Yeah, and and I read somewhere that that it is, it, yes, it's due to a lot of these actual physical supply and labor things, but also this shift from the service economy to buying more things. Um, I I like to think that it's. I like to think that that's not necessarily as. I think people are moving back to buying more services. I, I wonder. If uh, I wonder if that's the real hiccup um, yeah. in the supply chain, yeah. Because if that's true, then then there's a lot more underlying. Then then there's a lot more work that needs to be done to make you know to make things move around quicker. Because if we have a sustained higher uh, a, a sustained higher demand for logistics, then um, then we got yeah. Then stuff. I mean, I guess we've got more truck drivers than we. You did in like 2019 now, but we've been hiring so much, but still don't have enough truck drivers. Um, yeah, talk about the longshoremen. <laughs> what are we going to do? I don't know. Yeah. Um, so one great resource we talk about a lot where you can find all this information, a lot of great research reports. You got to save today. If you, don't, if you don't have the best information, appropriate information, it's harder to make. Um, decision because you know risk you know investing it's all about quantifying quantifying risk as much as possible understanding it and that way you can mitigate it um because you're taking risks but if you can mitigate and you can understand the risk um you can see a lot of clarity you can make some quick decisions because you know how to you just understand the landscape 
And to do that, you have to know um, what the market conditions are like. That's why we build Gray Report. It's a multifamily intelligence aggregator. It's aggregating tons, every single you know latest research report, again, data points, all the articles that are coming out about the multifamily industry, about the economy and real estate, we're kind of putting it all in one place. Um, and the value that we're hoping to add to you and to provide you for free is going to save you a lot of time. Um, because if you're not staying up on like the current market, then you're you really not you don't have the appropriate amount of information to make smart decisions. Instead of scouring the internet every single day, this is up updated 24 seven and very thoroughly. I mean, if you if you're reading even a small portion of what's on the Great Report every day, um, you're going to be up to date. We're also bringing in some really good podcasts, um, great videos, video content both you know from other others other groups um original content it's it's all here um so highly recommend it grayreport.com and then of course make sure you're signed up for the gray report newsletter again that comes out every thursday morning at 8 30. it's the most valuable multifamily newsletter that's out there hands down continually right at the top um you know four and a half stars so uh, gray report or graycapitalllc.com slash newsletter is the best place to sign um, up for that. All right, Matt, you, you doing anything exciting uh, the next day or two? What's what's on the agenda for uh, the Boss Nago family? Uh, I'm going to pick out a Halloween costume. Oh, cool. What, what are you picking out? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I like, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Are the stores, full, like, are they, are they are any supply chain issues? You're going to have to do a report when you go to the Halloween store. Yeah. Are the you know stores make, full or the, or the shelves stocked or not? If I have to make it myself, I, I might have to. Um, maybe I'll do I'll do a tinfoil box robot, and that'll be if Classic. I can find the boxes. <laughs> we had a hard time finding finding boxes the other day, and and again, you know, and we've been joking about okay, so there are all these real supply chain issues. At what point, what does it just become an excuse to not have something? Yeah. It's easy to blame the supply chain because it's like it's the it's the supply chain. It's this national global thing. I can't control the supply chain. It gets in when it gets in. Yeah. Okay. That is the case most of the time, but when is it not? Okay. Thank you for watching um, this edition of The Great Report. Give this video a like if you appreciated it, got something out of it. Um, we'd love to hear your opinion. So leave a comment at the bottom. If you subscribe to The Great Capital YouTube channel, you're going to get an alert every time one of these videos pops out. So you continue to stay up to date in the know, make those good decisions. Again, if you haven't signed up for the Gray Report newsletter, not only are we disappointed, um, you have an opportunity to really make us happy. Sign up for the Gray Report newsletter, greatcapitalllc.com slash newsletter. Matt, thanks again for really um, leading the charge. Great newsletter again, great report, all good stuff, good analysis. I'll see you next week.